Hello everyone, uh, my name is Neil. So I'm a data strategist in Channel 4 in the data science team there. And I'm here today to talk to you about a project called Contextual Moments. Um, it's been around for a while now, um, but there's going to be some new stuff which we've not shown before today in this. Um, I'll explain exactly what it is in a moment, but some of the things we're going to be talking through is about the challenges of innovation in a traditional broadcaster. Um, but before I do that, I want to talk to you slightly about where we came from. Um, the data science team and our data journey started about eight years ago. And we became the first broadcaster in the world to start to collect first party data on our users. Um, seems really simple now, but at the time is quite groundbreaking. Um, this enabled us to do data trials with different advertisers and become the first broadcaster in the world to do demo demographic targeting on VOD and also then interest based targeting. And we even ran the world's first personalized TV campaign for Coca Cola. But after that, the innovation started to slow down. VOD and digital started to sort of, you know, catch up with the rest of the market. It became harder to us. And it started to occur to me that uh, linear TV was a bit of an unloved child and we needed to put some attention back to it. And that's when contextual moments came about for me. Um, I'll go through a bit more about that journey in a moment, but first, here's a bit on exactly... Since the dawn the of the modern world, advertisers have sought appropriate context for their messages. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not so easy. But what if there's a better way, a much better way, maybe even a way twice as good? It's time to learn about a world-first product called Contextual Moments. It's not a new luxury condom brand, but it is all about finding the sweet spot for advertisers, instances in our programs when a golden opportunity occurs. Talking of sweet things, let's imagine you're a baking brand. To get more people to try your amazingly crumbly biscuits, you might think it's a good idea to advertise during the Great British Bake Off. But how do you find context beyond the obvious opportunities? Well, with contextual moments, Channel 4 identify every baking opportunity across all our content. In fact, we do this for loads of categories. How? Science. The eggheads on Channel 4's data science team have built sophisticated AI and natural language processing algorithms that analyze the video and sound data in our shows to automatically identify the objects, actions, and themes that brands want to appear next to. That was exciting. At certain moments, a particular product, for example, a coffee, is highly visible. We call this prominence. And there is a clear expression of favorable sentiment. We call this positivity. The two combined create our sweet spot. But does placing ads near these contextual moments deliver? Well, in our stringent laboratory testing, the results of placing relevant ads close to these moments were startling. Our results showed that those exposed to an ad contextually were twice as likely to remember seeing it compared to those who saw it in a regular slot. This drove large uplifts in spontaneous awareness, positive brand perceptions, and purchase consideration. To understand these results, we partnered with the neuroscience team at Durham University, who are working on the theory that content that has recently been accepted in the brain is easier to code as memory. Our receptiveness to words and images is boosted by previous exposure to similar words and images. The theory, which they believe explains the huge leap in recall, is that when we see, say, a dating scene within a show, our neural network for dating is activated which helps build the memory of a related ad shown in the following break. So, while you might not think you need to be reminded that you like biscuits, and hey, who doesn't like biscuits? Watch the relevant scene in a program. If you're a biscuit, what biscuit would you be? And the biscuity part of your brain lights up like a giant, uh, floodlit biscuit. In case you're wondering, no, the robots aren't running the show. We take brand safety very seriously, so a human uh -huh. double-checks every contextual moment for fail-safe brand protection before any contextual ad hits the screen. Want to know more? Get contextual this moment by visiting forsales.com or email us. So that's the product and that's some of the research that backed it. I'm going to talk you through how we got to that point of delivering this and then I'll talk you through some more research results that we've had from it. Um, so I'm slightly applying, applying this sort of continuous innovation circle here retrospectively after we'd run the project, but it sort of summarizes how we got to where we did today. Um, and it was a, a sort of a phase of ideation, development, testing, selling, trialing, building, evaluating, and then basically figuring out what's next. And the first part for Elias was ideating, coming up with the idea. Now, interestingly, the idea for this came out of a small seed of an idea from our technology team who were playing around with what they could do with subtitles data, the subtitles for our programs, and they saw that you could start to derive meaning from those. 
I took that idea sort of home and was thinking about it a while, and I realized that I basically can't watch a program where a character has a glass of wine and then not want to have a glass of wine myself. And so that got us thinking, can we start to build these different types of products for different types of categories and then have advertisers near it? This is our eureka moment. But it occurred to me that the types of opportunities I notice in our program for contextual uh, advertising might not be the same as the types of opportunities that many of you in the audience might notice. You need to be rep representative in this research. So um, I decided to bribe people with pizza, effectively, and got various different people from the Channel 4 office sitting in uh, our meeting rooms at lunchtime, watching programs, and coding what they saw in the program to see what different types of people noticed. This enabled us to understand the, the scale of the opportunities that exist for various different categories, the types of things that people do notice in programs, the types of things people don't notice in programs, and any risks that exist with this type of advertising. Um, so it was basically taking the idea of democratized ideation, but with a light bribe of pizza. But after this, we had to really continue to develop what the uh, product or proposition might be. Um, and for us, this has started off um, as a proof of concept, basically proving that machines can identify these moments in our programs. As the video mentioned, we used machine vision and NLP to do this, but we had to check that we could do it and do it to a high enough standard that it was going to be better than a human going through a TV guide and ticking off certain things. And our POC proved that and enabled us to understand lead times for delivering this project and to start to understand some of the barriers that we had to overcome. Um, but what was interesting, really, is that to deliver this, we had to talk to pretty much every team across the uh, business at Channel 4, bar a few. And that really unearthed some unexpected problems here. The fact that we had to get you know, cert certain legal and security clearances to process our content in this different way when we had it coming from so many different <laughs> suppliers. The problems of making sure that the content could be viewed by different people in the team to ensure it's brand safe, and also the ad operation side of things, which I'll come to later. Um, but I really does show you the value of talking to all the different teams in the business before you fall down a rabbit hole of starting to solve a problem. Now, um, the next stage for us was to test the concept. And what I mean by this is prior to us even launching this project, we mocked together um, some TV programs with some contextual ads in it and some non-contextual ads in it. And what that enabled us to do was just to test to see whether advertising in this way was more or less effective. Um, and these results then would enable us to go out to speak to advertisers and understand how interested were they in this proposition before we launched it as a fully-fledged uh, opportunity. Um, you saw some of the results in the video there, that it uh, drove spontaneous brand awareness, positive brand perceptions, and first brand consideration, and the key headline being that it doubled ad recall. We did lots more research when we sort of ran our real-life trial on this, again, which I'll come to later, and there was loads of other interesting results, and anyone's particularly interested in those, let me know, and I can share some of the those with you. Um, I've got a very quick slide on building it here, though. Um, and the reality is that this building went on for about a year, um, and it really expanded, uh, expanded all these different touch points that we have here. Our V1 was pretty good, but it wasn't quite as good as it can be, and we're working on a V2 where it would be taking more of a deep learning approach. Again, I'd like to talk more, more about that in more detail, but uh, time uh, holds us back slightly now. But armed with those um, uh, results that uh, you saw earlier, we were able to go to the market and we were able to talk to advertisers to understand what they thought about this opportunity, to see if this is the type of thing that they would pay a premium for, this is the type of thing that they would want as part of their regular deal. But with these results, we found that there was a lot of interest in this. And um, uh, after announcing this at our advertising upfronts, we uh, gave the opportunity for advertisers to take part in our world first trial, where we delivered um, automated contextual advertising on linear TV for the first time. We had 50 advertisers request to take part in this trial, and four were selected. Um, I'm going to show you one very slightly edited example of a real thing that we place live on TV now, and then some uh, research results from that will again appear later. Hopefully there. Yes. Because it will explode. They will explode. It will explode. Explode during the cooking. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. The finished pasta goods are briefly boiled, sauced, oh. and served. Straight in. Bon appetito. Mm. Well, it's a triumph. That's delicious. It is, I can confirm. <laughs> oh, my God. All Tesco pasta has been lovingly made by the same three Italian families for generations. Food Love Stories, brought to you by Tesco. So, like I said, it's a very edited clip of the, the full thing in the programme. It's from a programme called Travel Man, where a comedian takes a comedian friend around a different European city. In this case, they went to Rome, made fresh pasta, and were able to put an advert for Tesco pasta just near that. It's a fantastic contextual opportunity. 
So I'm moving on to the valuation of the, uh, what we do with this project now, but this is in two parts. The first part is evaluating the advertising effectiveness of it here, and I'll show you one quick example. The second part will be the operational challenges um, that we had with this. I'll talk about that in a moment. But yeah, first of all, the effectiveness. Like I say, we did stuff in the lab, but we wanted to test real adverts that we uh, delivered, like the one that you just saw. Um, and um, one of the examples I'm gonna give you now um, is uh, from some neurological insight we did, where we basically partner with a company called Neuro Insight, and we got about 100 people in a room, um, and we strapped these swimming hat-looking devices to the head, which have electrodes on them, and they effectively measure um, long-term memory coding. So if you think about that example from Travel Man just before, what we'll have is we'll have a bunch of people who watch this advert um, and they will see it next to that program that you just saw. So they see it next to that contextual opportunity. But another part of people will see this exactly the same advert, but they'll watch it in sort of an unrelated contextual program. There's no contextual link to it. And what we do is we then compare the levels of memory coding across those two different test groups. Um, so I'm gonna show you a clip of another contextual opportunity that we had at the moment. This is just a clip from the program. I'm gonna try and talk over that, this clip. I don't know if that will work. We'll see what happens. Kyle, mind if I join you? Oh, well, uh, just for a little while. I'm meeting Mel here. Oh, reminds me. Oh, dear. I am sorry to hear that. Oh, no, actually, this is wonderful news. Mm. She called. She said, my days of playing the devoted husband are coming to an end. Fraser. I think my wife is finally going to dump me. Oh. <laughs> ah, so, as you can see, it would it's Frasier, not so bad as in a coffee house talking you know, actually, I'm um, celebrating a bit about the relationships, but the key see, thing is that they're in a coffee house, so I what advert can we place around this? A well, mentor. Uh, what you'll see, hopefully playing in a moment, this is a slide that always breaks for me, so apologies if anything goes wrong, is um, an advert uh, for McCafe, uh, the McDonald's coffee brand. Uh, what you've got on the uh, left-hand side here is um, a, a video uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the prime sample. So this is, no, sorry, that's the unprime samples. This is people that saw the advert but not next to any contextual opportunity. And on the right-hand side is the prime group who saw the same advert again but next to that contextual opportunity of Knowles and uh, Frazier sitting in a coffee house. And you see these lines and that represents the level of memory coding that's happening. Madness. Madness, they call it madness. I just want a coffee. It's plain to see that is what they mean to me. Madness, madness, I call it madness. That's nine pounds. <laughs> what? McCafe. Great tasting coffee. There you go. Simple. Thanks. I appreciate that you said you could see the levels of memory code. It's quite hard to read those lines. Um, so I'll talk for it. But what you can see is generally the levels of memory code is slightly higher for the uh, people that saw that in a contextual state. And to give you that, it's slightly, oh, oh, that was on me. <laughs> I will talk awkwardly as this gets fixed. So good, you get to see it twice. Madness, madness, they call it madness. I just want a coffee. It's plain to see that is what they mean to me. Madness, madness, I call it madness. That's nine pounds. <laughs> what? McCafe. Great tasting coffee. There you go. Simple. Thanks. That will boost long-term memory encoding. Uh, so um, what we've got here is the same charts that you just saw, but we've sort of put them stacked against each other. So the one on the top is people that saw that advert in a contextually prime state. The ones in the bottom is still in an unprime state. And what you can see if you look at towards this um, sort of figures one and two at the end is the levels of memory coding when the two uh, brand logos appear, one from McCafe and one from McDonald's. And you can see that the levels of memory coding at these key branding points were significantly higher. And that's because they were primed to it through the contextual placement of the program. 
Uh, okay, so that works really well. So, and then what you can see uh, again as well is the overall levels of memory coding from McCafe were up 11 percentage points from 65 to 76. And also the uh, uh, two other brands that we ran in this trial saw boosts with an average boost across all of those ones there. We had loads of other research results which backed up the, the stuff you saw earlier and more stuff around this. Again, I can talk to you about that another time if you're particularly interested. But I'm just going to sort of wrap up by saying some of the challenges that we had for this. I mean, the trial was a huge success for us. We got a lot of attention, but it came with um, sort of uh, some issues from an operational point of view. We're basically trying to take a new way of advertising and combine it with legacy systems and processes which exist within TV. And I think the big learning for me is that TV has to move forward in its back-end systems to be able to deliver more uh, stuff like this. If programmatic was available at scale, this would be significantly easier to deliver, for example. Uh, that being one of the problems was that a lot of TV content, we don't get two or three days before transmission, sometimes a day before transmission. If we've already scheduled a bunch of adverts to appear near that program, we then have to shift them around to be in a different program, and that causes huge problems with buyers all over. Um, there's many other problems as well, but I sense my time is running out, so I'll go a bit quicker now. Um, and I guess the real thing is for us, what's next? Um, the trial is on a small hiatus right now while we sort of unsolve some of those um, um, operational problems, but I generally believe this is a really uh, good way forward for to sort of increase the yield that you get on your cover advertising, and it's something that all uh, broadcasters can do as long as they have the right permissions on their content. Um, but what I will say is that you really need to think about the uh, operational systems that come along to support this. Um, it probably won't ever appear across every single um, advert that appears on TV because there's not that many really strong contextual moments that happen all through the break, but it is there for a good chunk of them. Um, Thanks very much. Let me know if there are any questions.